I am Dr. Kulbushan Dagar, Principal Director and Chief Surgeon for Pediatric Cardiac Surgery at Max Super Speciality Hospital, Saket, Delhi. In today's video, we will be discussing the basics about congenital heart defects in children. Congenital heart defects are basically structural defects of the heart and the blood vessels which are present since birth. So what this means is that there is a malformation of the heart and its associated structures while the child is in utero before pregnancy. So most people would be very surprised to know that uh, congenital heart defects are the commonest congenital defects in children. They are more common than the neural defects and other defects like Down syndrome. To look at a country like India, around eight to nine children out of every thousand live births will be having a congenital heart defects. This basically translates into approximately 200,000 children having a congenital heart defect every year. And out of these, about 40 to 50,000 children will need some sort of an intervention within the first few weeks of life. Unfortunately, because of lack of awareness and other social and economic factors, most of these children will not be reaching out for medical attention and would probably not be alive after about one year of life. So the development of the heart starts within the first few weeks, about six weeks of uh, conception and most of the defects would happen then. Uh, unfortunately, we still do not know what are the exact causes of these congenital heart defects. However, what we know is that a few conditions can predispose to a higher incidence of CHD during pregnancies. The most common of of these are infections during pregnancy and that too within the first trimester, that is the first three months of pregnancy. The most common of these infections is rubella, the more commonly known as German measles. The good thing is that people can be vaccinated against this prior to becoming pregnant. The other common cause is diseases like diabetes. Mothers should have the diabetes and blood sugar under control before they conceive. The third common cause which has been known to increase defects is certain medications during pregnancy. Uh, these include very commonly administered drugs known as ACE inhibitors for controlling of uh, blood pressure. Certain anti-epileptic drugs have also been known to increase the incidence. Certain lifestyle uh, practices like uh, drinking and smoking during pregnancies have been known to increase the incidence of uh, CHD. There is a familial predisposition, that means genetics has a role to play. Certain families would be more predisposed to CHD. And also environmental factors like being born at high altitude in the mountains also predisposes you to certain congenital heart defects. Broadly, they can be classified into two main groups. The first group is where there is no blueness associated with the defects. These are known as the acyanotic congenital heart defects. And these include entities like holes within the heart, which could either be an ASD or VSD. They could also involve abnormalities of the valve in the sense that the valve could either be very narrow or it could be a leaking valve. Narrowing of blood vessels, an example being coarctation of iota, would also be included within asynotic congenital heart defects. The other and the more serious ones are where the defects are associated along with blueness or cyanosis in medical parlance. What happens in these is that A, either the blood is not reaching the lungs to be purified, as would occur in what is known as a pulmonary atresia, where the lung artery is not connected to the right side of the heart, which pushes blood to the lungs. The other causes could be that the blood mixes within the heart because the structural alignment of the heart and blood vessels is not normal. The commonest example of this is what is known as a transposition. Here what happens is that the main blood vessels are not arising from their respective ventricles and get interchanged. So what happens is that the blood which is supposed to be oxygenated and coming back from the lungs doesn't do that and it goes straight back to the body, thereby producing blueness for the child. The other defects which can be encountered in these children could be a various combinations of these. And a common example is known as tetralogy of fallow. So what happens in tetralogy is that you have a hole within the heart. The blood vessel carrying the blood to the lungs is narrowed. The main blood vessel which should originate from the left heart tends to overlie the right heart to some extent 
and associated with that there is a hypertrophy or an increased thickness of the right side of the heart. So what most of these uh, defects either in isolation or combination is going to do is that they are going to impair the way the blood is handled by the heart and the way the circulation happens. So either too much of blood would be going to the lungs or too little blood would be going to the body. The symptomatologies which these produce would be you can either have an ashen color of the skin or you can have a blueness of the skin coming up. The child will have difficulty in feeding. So a young child will have difficulty in suckling. So when we mean difficulty in suckling, it basically means that the child would start suckling at the breast, he'll get tired, then he'll stop, regain his breath and then start uh, breastfeeding again. This is basically because of the heart not being able to compensate for the increased work of the suckling. The third common cause would be an impairment of weight gain. So children should be gaining weight at a particular rate as they grow. And because of the increased demands of energy with the heart defect, they are not able to keep pace with the growth. The third thing or a fourth thing would be a very, very irritable child who cannot be consoled. You can also have children having shortness of breath or they have breath which is very, very rapid, totally out of context of the amount of physical work that they are uh, doing. So what I would say is that if your child ever shows a little blueness either in the nails, the lips or the tip of the tongue or he is very short of breath or he is absolutely inconsolable, these are the times where you cannot ignore, you must take your child to a specific or a specialist doctor and in this case it is going to be not the pediatrician but a pediatric cardiologist who will be further looking at your child and will determine whether there is an underlying cardiac defect or not. So when you visit a pediatric cardiologist, the first thing a doctor would be doing would be taking a detailed history. He would basically want it to know whether there's any blueness or not. After that, he would be examining the child just to make sure that the pulses and other things are normal. Uh, once he has examined the child, he would be running certain basic tests now, let me emphasize that all of these tests are very simple, they're preliminary and they're generally painless. So what your doctor is probably going to ask is look at an x-ray chest. He is, when he's asking for an x-ray chest, he is basically wanting to see the size of the heart, any abnormalities in the rib cage, and possibly the amount of blood which is flowing into the lungs. The other very common test is an ECG, which sort of helps him to differentiate between the various diseases. The hallmark in today's world as we speak and talk is going to be an echocardiographic examination. What an echocardiography does is that basically it uses ultrasound to reconstruct the structure of the heart. It gives us information about the function of the heart. It also lets us interrogate the valves and lets us know whether the valve is narrowed or leaking. And it also allows us to look at structures around the heart. And the next level of complexity in investigation would be the use of either a CT scan or a cardiac MRI. The CT scanners are basically used when you're wanting to look at the structure of the heart and the surrounding lungs in a greater detail. MRI also does the same but has the added advantages that it gives you a lot of information about the functionality of the heart. Very, very rarely one may need to do what is known as a cardiac catheterization. This is probably the only test which is invasive. And during a cardiac catheterization, very thin tubes are inserted via the leg into the heart. And the information that they give us is about the pressures within the heart the way that the heart is functioning and it also allows us to do interventions and manage certain conditions without surgeries. So the management can be divided into three broad groups. Certain entities would only need to be managed by medications and they do very well on that. There are certain entities where there is a structural defect would need some form of therapy to treat the defect. In today's world, Certain holes like ASDs, some VSDs, narrowing of the valves, narrowing of the blood vessels can be tackled non-surgically, making use of catheter-based interventions with excellent results. 
The vast majority of congenital heart defects, however, still need to be treated surgically. And let me assure you, there is a treatment for practically every single defect that can exist. The very, very small minority of defects which cannot be corrected structurally by surgery, there is always the option of considering either a mechanical assist or a heart transplant for these children. So the single message that I would like to put across to everybody would be that congenital heart defects do exist. But the good thing is that all of them can be treated. And what is most important is the best results are generally achieved when these children are treated on time. So when I say on time, it basically means it's within the first few weeks to within the first few months of life. Do not go by the old concepts and grandmother tales that the child should be of a particular weight or he should be of a particular size. That doesn't matter. What is more important is what is the underlying defect and the vast majority would need to be treated within the first three to six months of life. Excellent results are achieved by either intervention or by surgery. And most of these children can go back and lead active, healthy, playful childhood and they integrate very well into society and lead very constructive, fulfilling adult lives. A small percentage of these defects will need multiple surgeries. So these children would need to be under follow-up or so-called surveillance. So if you have been told that your child has a complex congenital heart defect, then the surgery may need to be staged, but here again, the results are excellent and very, very fulfilling for these children.